So first off, I would like to say thank you so much, Doc, for joining us on the show. I really do appreciate having you. And uh, you're a little bit harder to track down than probably the president, but, uh, you know, <laughs> in the end, we got to you. We got to you. I do you think so. I feel like I'm so easily accessible. I sh I'm like, too really? easily, I'm too easily accessible. I need to put up some layers, you know? <laughs> no, nah, you know what? Sometimes it does feel that way. I feel that way also too. Like, you know, I used to host like, you know, maybe 30, 40 Yeshiva Bachman when I lived in Yerushalayim every week, every Friday, I had a big suda just like that. And so, you know, how it starts, you give out your phone, you give your phone number to a few guys. Then the few guys gives it to another few guys. And before you know it, it's like on the wall at the Mir Yeshiva and everybody has your, your phone number and you don't get a single second of rest. And then from that Yeshiva to the next Yeshiva and to the next Yeshiva. So I, I definitely, uh, I know about being way too accessible. Yes. Completely. Yes. So I, I have a question for you. So you're first generation American, right? Yes, that's, that's correct. correct. Yep. All right. So you have to tell me because of that, I, I'm very, very interested. I want to know in, in the shortest form, because I know you, you get this a lot, because I know, I know when people get it a lot, because I get it a lot also. What is your story? Like how, how did you get to where you are right now and what happened along the way? Yeah, no, I mean, it is an incredible story, but I think as you're going through it, you just feel, you know, kind of like it's just normal. But, you know, looking back on kind of the trajectory of my life, I think it's been truly extraordinary. And uh, basically, my mom, you know, we lived in Iran, we were Persian Jews living in Iran, and my mom wanted me to be a citizen. So she came to New York when she was nine months pregnant to basically have me be born in New York. So in my family, I'm actually the only citizen. I think I was actually born two weeks late because she was just like, <laughs> but anyway, so um, after that, we stayed in New York for about just a month, went back to Iran. It was 1979, the year of the revolution. And so after that, we were kind of stuck. They didn't treat Jews great, but they also didn't let us leave. So mm -hmm. it was kind of interesting. You know, if you got valedictorian, you wouldn't get the award. The, the next person who wasn't Jewish would get it. Just like super microaggressions. And then there was absolute macroaggressions where people were getting killed or jailed or, you know, things like that. So um, we kind of knew that it wasn't going well. And I think in 1985, when there was the Iran-Iraq war, a bomb landed very close to our home. And I totally remember the sirens going off and we would run to the windows in the middle of the night. My mom would be like, look at the beautiful fireworks, you know, but now mm -hmm. seeing, you know, the, the bombs being launched at Israel, it, it looked exactly like that in Iran, wow. Wow. Uh, but except it was coming from Iraq. So, uh, you know, we uh, basically arranged, my father was a physician and he had had a lot of visiting professors come in. He had some connections. So he left the passports of my mom, my sister and I with the government and said he was going on a medical talk in Vienna. So he flew out to Vienna, lived with one of the professors who was his friend. And my mom, my sister and I arranged with smugglers to be smuggled across the Pakistani border. Um, basically, we went to the bazaar. They put us in the back of a covered like pickup truck with a cover kind of, or like a, almost wow. like a hearse, but like a bigger version. And wow. then we, we were on the bottom and they put uh, corn on top of us to hide us. And then we went from the bazaar across the border, spent one night in the desert. And um, actually we got seen by the border guards at, at a certain point and they started sh shooting at us and our lights were off. But as soon as they started shooting, we just turned the lights on and mm -hmm. kind of zoomed and the way we got away there was a there was like two mountains with like a ravine and so two mm -hmm. wheels of the truck were on one side two wheels of the truck were on the other and we went over it and the border police just thought that was too dangerous so that's how we kind of got away so we we spent you know uh one night in the desert once we made it past the pakistani border i remember we were at this like clay shack basically that was a bathroom and there was just it was basically just a hole in the ground and i was right. too small to straddle the hole like you could totally just fall in um and in that bathroom my mom told me we were going to america and i was like i'm gonna meet michael jackson because we had so many like <laughs> bootleg madonna and bootleg michael jackson videos like thriller you know um and then we spent about uh, three months in Pakistan and we were with a bunch of people who uh, were smuggled out of Iran. So we would have parties every night in the hotel um, and sort of like hung out until our visas 
came through. And then once they did, we went to Vienna. And after not seeing my dad for a few months, we uh, reunited with him. And I remember I was seven years old at the time, but I remember seeing him and he had shaved his beard. So I didn't recognize him. And then he started speaking. And then I recognized that it was my dad. Mm -hmm. um, and then together we, yeah, together we came to America. And I always, you know, tell the story of like, I, I came in the first grade, I didn't speak any English. I was in ESL for about three months and just got a lot of teasing. I was really skinny. And back then, like you weren't allowed to do anything about your mustache. You weren't allowed to shave your legs because it meant you were trying to be attractive or you were going to be promiscuous. So mm -hmm. I was just like, really didn't fit in. And then also I was that girl in class that was like always raising her hand, you know, always had the answer kind of. So mm -hmm. it was it was a little rough um, making <laughs> friends. And I just felt like people were always like using me for something, like using me to copy my homework or using me to like get the answers to something. Um, and then, you know, slowly kind of made my way merit based through the ranks of higher education, got into a really prestigious private school when I didn't even know what private schools were like all the smart kids left in the seventh grade. I'm like, where are you going? They're like private school. I'm like, what's private school? So then mm -hmm. I went in the eighth grade when they were like only accepting five people. Then from there, I went to Columbia University. Then from there, I went to Yeshiva's medical school, Albert Einstein, um, mm -hmm. and then got into USC plastic surgery, which was probably like the best match my medical school had ever had ever had because plastic surgery is really hard to get into. Right. Um, and then spent three years in general surgery at USC in California, uh, did two years of business school in between general surgery and plastic surgery and then did three years of plastic surgery came out um and just you know oh and i got married my first year of residency had three kids during surgical residency which was difficult um and came out started my own private practice and knew immediately i wanted to do tv so wow. I just started making YouTube videos like this. nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew my name. Everybody was like, wow. who, the, who the F are you? <laughs> so I was just like, you know what? I went to business school. I know how this works. This marketing, you know, shtick yeah. works. So I basically just started making videos and then Google owns YouTube. So me putting out a ton of YouTube videos when nobody else was doing that got my ranking on Google so high. You know what though? I'm sorry. Yeah. I just, I'm, I'm listening to it and I'm like perplexed at all these different, how we jump from like being shoot shot at to, to YouTube. Like, <laughs> but the thing is, no, I'm, I'm being honest. I'm being honest with you. It's almost like a blessing that you went through everything that you went through because, and because you didn't come. And I would say like, you know, generally in a, in American, we're, we're kind of lazy when it comes to stuff It's being, being very honest with you. Like you were grinding you understand i've what been that, grinding that's what for grinding. 40 years <laughs> wow yeah that's no like and i mean you know, and the other thing too like you know i lost my mom to breast cancer when i was 16 years old and that caused wow. me to be very independent very early on like i remember the first time i went for my driver's like practice we went on the freeway mm -hmm. we were on mall holland we were like on these crazy winding streets and it just forced me into independence and i have my own nonprofit conference every year and one of the speakers a couple of years ago said something really interesting he said if i love someone i wish them hardship if i mm. love someone i wish them challenges because those are the things that make you grow and give you right. resilience and give you grit and really propel you to success because have you ever met someone super successful that doesn't have a great story? Like, no, right. no, you, know? sure. you don't, you cannot without, you know, it's a very famous thing without pain, there's no gain. And also just uh, along the lines of what, you know, what you just said, there's Rabbi Nachman him, himself. He, I remember after he came from one of his journeys, maybe, maybe it was his journey to Eretz Israel. And he came back from Israel and he said, I brought for you guys a gift. He's looking at all of his chassid and when I, I bring you poverty. <laughs> says, I bring you, I bring you poverty. I want, you know, I want you to be impoverished, you know, because when you're in that place, in the lowest place, you can't do nothing but, but give your all, right? That's so it. So it, it is something about having that struggle and without it, you just don't see it. I always tell people like this also. <clears throat> Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player to play the game, not because of the Michael Jordan who won the championships. It was the one who was killing himself in off-season workouts, right? He was working harder than everybody else. You mentioned Michael Jackson. 
Michael Jackson was putting in work that nobody else was putting in, not to mention his home life that we all seen on American Dream, which happens to be one of my favorite movies. Anyway, um, but we seen that what he had to go through in order to be Michael Jackson, nobody was signed up to, in order for Moses to be Moses. What Moses had to go through to be Moses is like, it's, it's, it's very, very telling of, of what success is and what one has to be willing to do in order to achieve success. So yeah, and I think, I think also as like a woman, it's really interesting to go through it. Like my parents never made me feel like a girl. Like I think my mom really wanted a boy, so she just raised me as a boy. I don't know. <laughs> but I think like, you know, navigating that as a woman has been really interesting too because I never really like realized I was at a disadvantage in any way. I actually think being a woman is an advantage, you know, in, in today's right? culture and like it's a differentiator, sure. right? But I think it's just been really interesting to sort of uh, go through it and uh, see it through a lens of a woman who never really, I don't know, remember that movie where that guy was blind and he was on the subway train? He goes, I'm black. Do you remember? that movie i don't remember this movie I, I how long ago did it come out it was I'm, I'm like sort of the, it was guy. like the 80s or 90s but okay, it's funny okay, it's okay. one of those like comedian shows but he's this blind guy and he's on the train he's like wait i'm black like <laughs> so it was kind of like that i was like wait i'm not white and wait i'm, I'm a woman like it was kind of right. like that but uh you know i i definitely do see like a lot of the online bullying like there's a study that just came out that showed that female surgeons are double as likely to be harassed online than their than wow. their male male counterparts so it's just kind of like me just kind of i was so focused that i didn't even notice people were like or you know putting roadblocks in my way i was just like roadblock jump it hurdle like the hurdles in the olympics i was like hurdle hurdle, hurdle. right right. it's just part of so, the game you know right no i understand this so let me ask you really quickly because a lot of people would say, you know, just because we have to talk about it, right? So plastic surgery, they would say, look at it as a bad thing, right? But you see it as often being a form of empowerment and you're all about empowering people. So can you tell me what yeah. cosmetic surgery, what it means to you? Uh, why do you think it was the right decision for people to make it and to do it? Like, you know, tell me about Well, it. I mean, I think like what people think about plastic surgery, especially because it has been in the past, like pretty expensive and maybe not accessible to all. So just right. like anything else, you know, just like Israel, they just believe what's being shown to them on TV, right? right. They've never actually right. been there. So, you know, with our Netflix show, a skin decision, we really just wanted to not make a circus of it and really highlight people who are getting plastic surgery for the reasons that like 90% of people are getting plastic surgery, not the 10% right. that you're seeing on all these funny shows on TV. Right. And so, you know, we really wanted to highlight like this, a gunshot victim or an acne, um, severe acne patient or a mother of quadruplets or a dancer who had three kids and literally looks like she's pregnant with abdominal hernias. Like, you know, and it, and it doesn't even have to be that. So I'm like, it could just be a breast augmentation, but now your body is more proportional and you feel better about yourself. Like I always tell people yeah. when you feel good, you, you know, you do good and it has ripple effects to everyone surrounding you, whether it's your kids, your husband, your, um, whatever. So I would mm -hmm. love to say, you know, oh yeah. Like, you know, love who you are on the inside and what you look on the outside doesn't matter, but it's just not true. And, and biologically and scientifically, it's not true. You know, mm -hmm. there's a reason why peacocks have feathers like that. There's, a, there's reasons why beauty in our, in nature and beauty and flowers, it's about survival. And we are genetically hardwired to appreciate beauty. So to tell someone who mm -hmm. doesn't feel beautiful, you know, uh, you should feel guilty about doing something about it when they're healthy and the, the procedure is safe to do, then I think you're really, it's almost like telling someone <clears throat> not to eat well. It's telling someone right. not to, not to exercise. Like if you can live better, and improve your quality of life and that's going to help you do more then it then that's a blessing and i think that that's the real reason why people get plastic surgery and that was kind of our message with the show and i'll tell you with the show we really changed how people see plastic surgery i mean it really was a right. paradigm right. shift in my profession um people from all around the world were messaging me like this gives me permission to feel okay about doing doing something for myself or i was getting my colleagues messaging me. I had two people show up today because of your show, you know? So it was kind of like just allowing people to look at it more as self-care and mental health rather mm. than seeing it as vanity or narcissism. Wow. That's amazing. 
That's amazing. So let me ask you this. Glamour.com said that your show Skin Decision is equally about healing and trauma as about looks, right? Because it all goes together like you just said. And that it paints a positive and realistic picture of cosmetic surgery procedures and what they can do. And, and this is what you were trying to accomplish. When you decided to go to Netflix, this was your thought, was that I'm going to go and change lives. Now, here's my question on top of it, right? So when I think of plastic surgery, first thing I think of is like, you know, not to throw it out there, but like Michael Jackson's nose or yeah. um, I think of, you know, uh, I don't, I don't want to say any more names, I guess, but people, you know, getting their lips like this big, you know, or like, you know what I mean? I'm thinking of all those other things. I don't even come to think about any of the things that you just said. Right. Right. Um, and so I think that there's, there's, a, there's, I don't know how fine the line is, but there's a line between what is subjective beauty and what is objective beauty, right? Certain things that you mentioned, like a peacock, but you know, a gazillion out of gazillion people will probably say that a peacock is beautiful. Maybe somebody thinks it's not, but I, you know, just certain things like that are flowers or natures to, to drive through and see Mount Rainier or, you know, a beautiful woman. But sometimes because of, you know, whether it's, it's Hollywood or whatever the case is that sometimes there's a subjective beauty that begins to change over time. At one point, you know, when people were bigger, you know, long, long time ago, then that was more attractive. That obviously also meant wealth, right? As opposed yeah. to where most populations did not have money. So it was more attractive to be bigger. And now it's, you know, it's went through sort of a season of where it's best to be super thin and very tiny and different things like that. So how do you balance it? Um, you know, when you have some people, is it, is it the same thing for you? Is it the same coaching when you feel somebody's coming in where they just like, you know, I want to look like, I don't know whoever it is. I want to look like Jennifer Lopez. Or, so yeah, no, or Nisim, I think just, you, you know. touched on like so many different things. So okay. Okay. number number one, I think branding as a plastic surgeon is incredibly important. So okay. I always message on my Instagram or website or any interviews I do or TV, you know, my hashtag is natural by Nazarian, you mm -hmm. know, or my breast augmentation is known as hashtag SBQ, which stands for small breast queen. So you mm -hmm. have to message what mm -hmm. your aesthetic is and what you find beautiful so that you attract people that share that aesthetic. So if somebody mm -hmm. comes in, ask, well, nobody even comes in asking me for large breasts because I'm the small breast queen. So yeah. it's like, and nobody's ever come in asking to look like a celebrity because I don't message that. I've literally right. never, ever, ever had anyone bring a picture of somebody else ever into my practice right well how many plastic surgeons can say that none right so it's basically messaging that we're trying to optimize you and we're trying to you know refresh you we're not trying to mm -hmm. make you look like somebody else and i won't do that and i message that so strongly that those people don't even come to me which is great because i only want awesome. sane people i don't want crazy people in my practice because also <laughs> like i don't get out much you know by the time i get home like i've been doing basically therapy, whether it's with a needle, a laser or a knife all day, that when I come home, I kind of don't even want to see people anymore. You know, I'm like, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so right, I think right, that's, right. I think, so I think that's like one part of it is like branding so that you attract the people that appreciate your values. Now, the other thing you talked about is changing and aesthetic. And it's interesting because I just did a course this, just this past week, it was a three day course. We had eight surgeons from all over the world fly in so we can go over uh, this special kind of surgery. Uh, I brought a really amazing physician from Bogota, Colombia up and we all kind of did, we, we did a course together for these eight surgeons. So he went over um, this changing aesthetic and it's really interesting how it went from like the Marilyn Monroe to the Twiggy to the, you know, and what you're talking about and like the Great Depression right. being a little overweight was better and then it was this small waist, big whatever. So right. I think what I, what I tell my patients is that you, when you're redoing your home, you don't go buy a couch that has paisley print on it. You don't go buy a couch right. that's plaid. You buy a neutral couch and then you change the pillows, right? right. So it's the same right. thing with your body or your face. You want to do something that's proportional to you, to that's you. Res respectful of your anatomy, right. and then you can change your clothes. But your right. body is not clothing that you can go donate it and go buy more, you know, 10 years right. from now. So, and I don't want people to be under my knife every two years. Maintenance, right. yes. You know, lasers, yes. Collagen building, mm -hmm. yes. But surgery, no. 
And so I literally have people that like had liposuction of their butt 20 years ago, and now they're coming in for me to put fat back into their butt. So it's just mm -hmm. like, if you just would have stayed proportional, uh -huh. you wouldn't right. have had to do this. But I think right. the aesthetic currently Nassim is not the super skinny. The, the aesthetic right now is the athletic and the healthy. So mm -hmm. I think people are coming in, even if it's for liposuction, you know, the mm -hmm. course that we did was to etch out muscles by mm -hmm. doing specific liposuction. So for example, on men in the arms, we'll etch mm -hmm. this out, etch this mm -hmm. out and make this a really sharp angle. So it makes the triceps look bigger. So we're Got strategically it. liposuctioning fat from certain areas to make them look more healthy. Got it. Got it. So Got I it. think, and Got I think it. that to me is the best aesthetic. And I don't think looking healthy is going to go out of style anytime soon. So, right. you know, e even, <laughs> even on the runways in Paris, if you have a BMI, um, which is a height to weight ratio, less right. than 18, you, you can't walk the catwalks in Paris anymore. So oh, wow. it's, it's not even, they're not even allowed to be anorexic looking anymore. Wow. 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 Yeah. So That's it's been, amazing. it's been a really interesting kind of thing, but to me, that athletic look, like, I don't want mm -hmm. that big butt. I don't think, mm -hmm. I think that's a trend and I don't do trends. I don't do this cat eye thing that's happening right now because 10 years right. from now when the almond eye is in, you're basically screwed. What are you going right, to do? Right. So I basically right. like, I don't do any trends. I go for harmony. I go for proportions and I'm right. respectful to that person's anatomy so that, mm -hmm. you know, they can have longevity with their results and just sort of like I could do one thing and they can go out into the world and conquer it. That's kind of yeah. my thing. And I think that's why people fly in to see me like 60% of my patients now are flying in, right? Because wow. they know they're not going to look like Michael Jackson. And if they're right. asking me, even if they're asking me to do it, I say, no, you're in the wrong place. Walk down the hall five steps. Because right, right, right. those patients become my billboards, right? Those patients right. become my little ambassadors. So if somebody mm -hmm. comes in, this is like a big thing that actually like <laughs> got a little attention, but I had mm -hmm. an influencer come in with massive lips. And she wanted yeah. me to do under her eyes. And I said, mm -hmm. I can't do under your eyes until you let me reverse and deflate your lips because nobody's mm -hmm. going to know anything happened here because all my results are natural. But mm -hmm. they're going to see your lips. You're going to tell them I'm your doctor and they're going to think I did that to you. And that's not right. good for me. Right. So if someone even walks in looking unnatural, I won't accept them as a patient until they let me make them look natural. Wow. 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 That's amazing. Okay. So shifting a little bit because you got to be like, thinking about plastic surgery i don't know when i'm a fix or not fix or not but you know i'm just thinking about it um so um so you have a lot of followers on instagram and of course we're going to talk about this now you use that audience um to try to spread truth about israel anti-semitism and what made you realize that you personally had to step up and start fighting that fight because you know, you're a plastic surgeon, right? Most people say, well, you know, this is what you do, you know, stay in your lane. Not only that, you're on Netflix, you know? So you, you stay in your lane, you have everything already. So why do you have to start getting involved? So what made you decide to step into politics or rather social issues? Uh, I actually started speaking up about, you know, anti-Semitism about a year ago because my mm -hmm. daughter was applying to my high school and I was like, oh my God, she's going to be in college in four years. Mm -hmm. And in the States, it's become a little toxic, you know, and I'm like, she's not even going to want to say little. she's Jewish. Oh. Yeah, a lot, a lot <laughs> toxic. Yeah. But I was and even my school, Columbia University, the reason why my father let me leave LA, because back then Persian girls did not leave their families unless they were moving into their husband's house. So the reason why my dad let me go to Columbia University even was that there was a 30% Jewish population at that school. And now mm -hmm. it's ranked the most anti-Semitic campus in the country. Wow. You know, they're, wow. they're painting swastikas on the steps. Like one of the, te you know, teacher's offices got broken into and they spray painted swastikas all over her, all over her wow. office. I mean, it's really, really bad and they're not really addressing wow. it very well. They've lost a lot of their donors a lot of the Jewish kids on campus do not feel safe. They pass BDS, like all this crazy. So um, I just started speaking about it about a year ago. And then when this conflict happened, I saw my colleagues who had like 100,000 followers, 120,000 followers, just, you know, spreading that same narrative, those five words right. they all love to use, you know, apartheid, mm -hmm. ethnic cleansing, cl uh, colonialist whatever and i was just like oh hell no i'm like i have more followers than all of you so i'm about to you know whatever so i just started i literally 
turn my Instagram stories and posts into, you know, truth telling basically. Cause you know, none of these people have been to right. Israel. Otherwise they right. would not be saying the things that they're saying. So Clear. I literally like in the first day lost 3000 followers. Um, and then I was just like, you know what? I don't care. Like I need to be able to like live with myself and sleep well at night. And if I'm quiet and I allow what happened to Iran to happen here mm-hmm. without a fight, I won't right. be able to live with myself. So that's kind of, you know, and it always starts with words, you know, in Iran, whether it's Iran, whether it's the Holocaust, whatever, it always starts with words and it always starts with the news stations. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, and if people hear Propaganda. it, propaganda and if people hear it enough they believe it to be true because they don't know any better they've never been there um and so i just knew that i had to do my best to kind of like fight the good fight because if the u.s goes down there is no more safe haven you know right no it's true so that was kind of why i started just like slamming hard and what was interesting was in the beginning just got ton of hate um lost a ton of followers people were like stay in your lane all of that but then something really interesting and now there, and now i was afraid like netflix would cancel me and like mm-hmm. all of this stuff and what was really interesting is that almost i would say i'm like probably net five thousand people down still mm-hmm. but um <laughs> so for all, all of you people listening help me out <laughs> but um but you know so many cool opportunities started flowing in so many Mm. cool people I got to meet. Um, I was hearing from huge politicians. I was hearing from huge people in Israel, um, you know, about like, let's do a collab. Let's do this. You know, I want to work with you. Like, I'm Mm -hmm. so proud of you. And it was just sort of like taught me a couple of things. Like speaking your truth is so rare these days that you become a hero. Like I was literally a hero for just like speaking my mind. Like that's how the other thing I learned is I don't actually know anyone that's gotten canceled because of, yeah, I don't know anyone who's gotten canceled for speaking up against anti-Semitism. No one. Right. Right. Do you, do you know anyone who's gotten canceled? No, I don't. No, you don't. It doesn't exist. Okay. It doesn't exist. Right. (laughs) Right. Um, yeah, yeah, I I guess so. I guess so. It doesn't. And I think there's this like fear because of our collective trauma Mm -hmm. about these things. Like we're going to get attacked. We're going to get, you know, canceled. We're going to lose business. It just doesn't happen. My patients were Mm -hmm. literally in tears, hugging me, thanking Mm -hmm. me for being the voice of reason, you know, and I'm not even like crazy, like political. I'm kind Mm -hmm. of right in the middle where I think 75% Mm -hmm. of the world lives, but it's Mm -hmm. just this like loud two majorities on either side that are like, you Mm -hmm. know, if you're not with us, you're against us. And it's like, well, I'm kind of with you, but I'm not like, not with you here, which is like what discussion is and you know, what college is about. It's about nuanced discussions and hearing other people's perspectives. But now if you speak a different perspective, you're racist or you're not woke or right, your right. whatever. And it's just like, it's cut the conversation so that people are only hearing this like very extreme narrative right. that doesn't right. represent the majority of people at all. It does not represent the majority. I, I always say like the most dangerous thing you can have from 2020 into 2021 is an opinion. That's the yeah. worst. That's the most dangerous thing that you can have in your yeah. pocket is an opinion. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's it really, it's unacceptable really, you know, and just seeing how many people and how much society has just changed and, and for the worse. And, and, you know, if you have children, you know what I mean? The, the amount of, of prepping you have to do to keep them politically correct and all this, other, I, like, I can't do that. You know what I mean? I wasn't, I wasn't raised that way. I don't believe in it. You know, yeah, I and the funny in God, thing, <laughs> you know, the funny thing to Nisam is like, you know, the definition of privilege to me is mm-hmm. being able to tell someone to change the English language to accommodate your feelings. Right. That right. is the definition right. of right. how lucky you are to live in a place that will change the language to right. accommodate your feelings. Mm. It's very true. Very like, powerful. go live in Iran for a day and see right, how, right, right. how they accommodate your feelings. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, and no. I think that's why the people that are immigrants are like the people that appreciate America so much because we right. know the alternative. Whereas like 
the Americans are just so, they just sound like little brats, you know, that are so. <laughs> Thank you for keeping it real. Wild. <laughs> like, I'm just like, do you understand how lucky you are to live here? Right. Like, literally, I went to Nike yesterday and I bought a USA jacket that like matches the ones the Olympians wear. Cause I'm just like, uh -huh. so happy to be here. Did you see what just happened in Afghanistan? Like, it is like the people, like, literally, there's a plane about to fly out. They are mm -hmm. climbing and hanging off of the of the staircase that goes to the entrance of the mm. airplane, trying to oh get on the airplane. It was I saw it last oh night, and I literally like to the I just like it was the saddest thing I have ever seen. I've seen a lot. That is just right. pure human desperation, wow. you wow. know. Wow. And wow. it's just wow. like wow. in looking at that, I literally my my nine year old was in you know laying in bed with me, and I just hugged her and I said, "We're so lucky to be here." We're right, so lucky right. to have this roof over our head. We're so lucky to have our freedoms. Right, and for right. anyone not to appreciate that in light of what's happening everywhere else in the world is just so ungrateful. And it bothers yes, me. No, I understand. I, I Trust me, a thousand percent, I, I understand. And I want to ask you this. So what is the most silly and the most, um, I would say, most consistent lie that you see online about Israel and about Jews in general? I mean, I think probably the most consistent lie is like the apartheid claim, yeah. <laughs> um, which is like, you know, um, right. but I think also it's just like, I think the other thing that really bothers me is how there's a double standard and like people are attacking the only right. democratic country in the region when, when, and then they're just completely silent on mm -hmm. Afghanistan or completely silent right. on Syria or Lebanon right. or, right. you know, even Iran. Right. And it's just and like, I mean, doesn't it like, I mean, it's like, hello, like, wake up. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I, I understand that. Like, you know, even I, I, it's just a, it has been a, a, a whirlwind of, of misprioritizing things also at that. Right. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna tell you you know my one of my personal issues Black Lives Matter right Oh my God okay, have you seen me posting <laughs> No I have not seen it yet Sorry oh, but I, I am very I, loud I see Black I Lives see the Matter. name and I and I'm ready to throw up already So that's probably why I didn't see it But no, I'm I saying mean, like I mean I've had this talk you know I just had Joshua Washington on my live and we talk oh, about Jay Wash Yes and we talk <laughs> about how you know Black Lives Matter as an organization is just disgusting and Right you know somebody asked how do we support black lives matter without supporting this this horrible organization that mm -hmm. even black people don't support you know i feel right. like the people supporting black lives matter are guilty white people right you know right. but even right. the black people are like that's a dangerous organization like all my patients that are black they're like Ooh, not that organization right. you know right right, right. It's a, i mean it's a complete joke it's misprioritizes the same thing that you're saying uh, with israel let's prioritize black people who are killed you know, by, by the police, which let's, let's even make it a propaganda. Cause not every single person that was killed was innocent, whether or not they had right. a weapon or didn't have a weapon. That's right. That's and then right. on top of that, let's ignore black the on thousands black. upon thousands of black on black crime. And let's ignore how many black fathers are not in the home because people are living off the, the welfare. Like, let's talk about if you're really not even to that, black lives, like there is you know? still an African slave trade happening. Oh uh, yeah. Like, for sure. Let's talk right. about that. I don't think anyone <laughs> right. knows that right. there is an right. Arab African right. slave trade right. happening. Still happening. Still happening. Right. You know, right. but right. let's focus on this like rare, like literally in, in, I mean, Joshua Washington went over it. Right. I mean, it is pretty mm -hmm. rare to have a white officer kill a black person, you know, with no cause. Yes, it happens. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's wrong. Yes, we should stop that. But right. compared to the other black deaths happening in our right. country, it is pretty like, it's like this much. Right. right, right but right, what they're right. doing and what I talk about, what I've been saying, like screaming from the hills is what they have done to the Palestinian people. Right. is weaponize them, politicize mm -hmm. them, and keep them suffering so that they can continue to get aid money, they can continue to exactly. get, you know, their political agenda pushed forth. And now they're trying to do with Black people in the United States. Right, right, right. They don't if, actually if somebody... care about them. Right. They're just trying to weaponize them and politicize them for their own gains. Right, right. Somebody wants to make money. That's all it is. At the end of the day, somebody is trying to make money somewhere. When it doesn't add up, and it yeah. does, just doesn't make sense. 
you know, like this. I mean, anybody that pays even just a little bit attention to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you will see that the whole entire thing just does not add up, you know, compared to what's going on online. It's just, it's really silly. I really take my hat off. I keep my keeper on, but I take my hat off uh, to you really for, for fighting. It's, uh, it's, it's a really huge thing. I always, myself, I struggle with that. And I'll be honest, because I'm, I... I'm a I'm a zero to 100 type of guy, right? Either I'm at zero or I'm at 100. I don't do in between too well, right? So when I am, you know, going and my whole my whole entire mindset is always is how how to bring and I and I feel like it's my mission, it's my God given mission to reveal God into the world, right? And that's it. But there's like, you know there's a lot of things that are just not true going on and it's hard to not speak out about things. And, and, and sometimes I look at people like yourself and, and other people, I'm a big fan of, you know, of, of a lot of people who are out speaking and I never know when it's time to pull the trigger or not to pull the trigger. And I'm not thinking about as much as, as not, um, it's not a financial thing for me, right? It's much more of a, of a thing is, is there possibly another way to make people understand? And I'm starting to see more and more. There's just no way to get people to understand because they're being bombarded with lies all day long, especially if they're watching television. You understand what I mean? Um, yeah. they, they're watching, except for if they're wa watching Skin Decision, obviously. But <laughs> unless, you know, they, they, they see the real deal, they're not, it, it's, it's almost impossible not to speak up anymore. Without, but I think, listen, you know, the thing is, like, they did you know a um they're doing polls in the u.s and it still mm -hmm. shows that you know about three quarters of the population in the u.s get it they're mm -hmm. just quiet wow right so i think right. well, the other thing what we need to realize there's a silent majority is what there's a saying. silent majority for sure it's been shown mm -hmm. in polls and mm -hmm. you know you i think you're just hearing you know the really loud minority but mm -hmm. the scarier thing for me is our universities you know it's exactly it's the indoctrination happening in schools and I mean, in our it's universities in the schools, all the, not even getting to the universities you're talking about the regular the regular schools elementary yeah, schools already. that's right and it, but it started in the universities you know right and i right. think it's about kind of getting that back and i think we have mm -hmm. to attack this very intelligently and we are behind the eight ball for sure but, you know, mm -hmm. it's about getting more politicians in. It's about getting more professors in. It's about getting more social media influencers. It's about bots. They have bots. You know, it's about, right. hack it's about hackers. They have hackers. Like, it's about, you know, kind of attacking. And, and also there's, you know, there's the Apex, but there's also like the Shield of Davids that will go find dirt on the professors. You're not going to fire right. that anti-Semitic professor. We will go right. dig up dirt on them so that you have no choice but to fire the anti-Semitic right. professor. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's getting kind of, and, and it's kind of been my mission for the last, you know, few months to get people that are working on and have similar mindsets together so that they're not working alone, but in tandem and that their mm. mission and their project become successful because they're not working in a vacuum, but rather, you know, they have the connections to work together, whether mm -hmm. it's the brain trust or funds or funds, to make. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's my last question, even though I like want to go on for like another hour, to be honest, <laughs> but I have, I, have, I have one last question that I want to know from you with all of your, you know, speaking up and, and fighting the good fight, what is the most powerful moment you had in your outreach to try to teach people about anti-Semitism? Do you feel like you ever taught somebody something? Do you ever feel like you changed somebody's mind? Um, if, if so, what, what was that time? I mean, I think I changed a lot of people's minds. I got a ton of messages um, from people. I think there's people that like you could never change their mind because they're literally born to hate Jews. Right, so it's right. very difficult to change those people's minds. I don't pay. Call I don't that even, blood. Yeah, call I don't even. Blood. Yeah, I don't even like waste my energy on on those people. Uh -huh. um, but there's a lot of people that were like, you know what? I really didn't know what to believe. But thank you for mm -hmm. being the voice of like both sides so that I can get mm -hmm. kind of a better opinion. But I've also, mm -hmm. I think one of the most powerful moments is during the conflict itself i had so many young people in bomb shelters in israel mm. messaging me mm. saying you are the only light i have in my darkness like wow. your your instagram posts and your support is the only light i have you know right now and i think that's kind of been the most powerful part of it is you know 
I was talking to uh, Rudy Rockman about it too. It's just one mm -hmm. by one, you know, it's not right. that you're going to change, you know, the masses opinion, but one by one, mm -hmm. people will start to see the truth, you know, eventually right. if they're open to it. Right. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, it's, it's been worthwhile, not just because, sorry, it's been worthwhile, not just because, I sort of was fulfilling a passion of my own. It's mm -hmm. been worthwhile with opportunities to meet people like you uh, and, you know, state senators mm -hmm. and people in Israel um, of influence and really all around the world. Uh, that's been amazing. Uh, it's given me permission to speak my truth without fear Right. And I was really afraid. I wasn't like this, like blind, insane person that was like, I'm just going to speak my truth and F everybody right. else. You know, I, right. it does matter what other people think, but right. it's just been such a blessing to be surrounded now with like-minded people who share my core values right. instead of being surrounded by thousands of people who don't really know who I really am and might not really mm -hmm. like me for my true self to right. be surrounded right. by such intelligent passionate people that share my core values that's been like the greatest gift and i can right. be 100 percent myself and mm -hmm. know that i am accepted and honored for that right right that's so listen, i highly recommend it's it. like it's like it's it's so powerful i was just having this discussion i think even when i was talking to fat man scoop about it, it's like mm -hmm. you want to be loved by people because they love you genuinely and you don't want to be loved by people, you know, um, because of what they think you're supposed to be, you know, a lot and of Nisim, people. I'll tell you the me. other thing too, is, you Go know, ahead. you, the other thing I learned is that you cannot have people obsessed with you mm -hmm. if you don't have people who hate, hate you. Right. Like you can't be middle of the road and have people be obsessed with you. Wow. That's right. That's right. That's totally true. That's totally true. That's fire. Drop the mic. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the mic. Drop my headsets. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Drop the headsets. Wow, wow. Doc, this has been amazing. I really do appreciate it. I uh, appreciate you coming on. And I wish you success in everything you're doing. Thank you so uh, in much. The, in the surgery room and also, and also in what you're doing online and, and helping out Call Yisrael. You're one of our fighters. You're, you're Queen Esther for us. So I really do appreciate you doing that. And uh, please keep fighting the good fight. And stay in touch. Will do. You too. Stay in touch. This was <laughs> such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much, Thank doctor. You. Thanks, Gilad. That was um, awesome. That was awesome. That was you really awesome. did. Like, I needed, I needed to hear, like, everything you said. <laughs> it was, like, everything I've been contemplating, like, going through, like, oh, my goodness. I just got to speak. Because, you know, sometimes you hear stuff and you see what's going on. And you just want to throw up. You yeah. Know? And it's like. It's unhealthy for me to continuously put me, especially in the entertainment industry. And the entertainment I know. industry is, is sickening, you know? I and know. to, like, constantly be in circles where you feel like you have to be quiet about things. Now, if I'm in a room and somebody says something, then I don't know if I will be able to hold back. But you know what I'm saying? Online, I've been very... I don't, I don't really run my own social medias. Every once in a while, I jump in and I check out what's going on, you know? Yeah. Or if I need to reach out to somebody, I will. But I have somebody else that runs it for me, you know? So I don't stay so busy with it, but... His you should side. speak yeah. up. I'm telling you, good things will come. You'll get a little bit of backlash for about a few days. Right. And then it's just like, you know, one of my, one of my followers said it best. She said, authenticity never disappoints. Right. Never so does. many, like so many good things will come to you. Cause you know, first of all, God's watching. Right. right. And I, and I really do feel propelled by God. You right. know, I feel right. like I am fulfilling, you know, a, a meaningful uh, purpose here. But at the same time, like you just get so many opportunities financially, you know, mm -hmm. PR, it's just, it, you go for it. When it and, and, and that's, that's the thing about it for me is like, then it doesn't feel like it's dirty money. You know what I'm saying? It's not, that's saying? right. Cause you're not when selling you're, when out. You're, when you're not, when you feel like you're selling out or you feel like you're being quiet about doing things, you don't feel complete. You don't feel shalem, you know? Yeah. And that's been my thing that I'm going to feeling like this is dirty money, you know? So, and I'm not, and I'm not even like going, but I just see the circles and who starts to embrace me. And it's because they see me, you know, I always say like this to the, to the, to the right, 
yeah. I have a lot of their core values. So yeah, I same. could be celebrated as a person for a person with core values on the right. On the left, I'm seen as a progressive. I'm activist. I'm, I'm black. I'm Hasidic. I'm accepted. I'm a progressive. Like, you know what I mean? And I wasn't going for any of that. I just was trying to serve you, Hashem, you know? Let me tell you, Nisim, like that that we share in that right. a, we ha- we both have a very powerful story. We're right. both not, not white. Right. 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 And we both kind of share, I, I kind of feel the same as you. I mean, I think I now I'm leaning a little bit more conservative, ra- right. you know, seeing like Nancy Pelosi's tweets and the squad and like all right. of that. But you know, when right. it comes to some social issues, I'm like, let the gay people be gay, like whatever, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. I, you know, but mm-hmm. I mean, I do tend to, you know, lean a little bit more people who do support the truth and who right. are speaking up for the truth and aren't like trying to be woke. Do you know what I mean? Right, and, right, and just right. trying to. Right. So, you know, I'm just going with it. And I feel like a lot right. of people, progressives, like when I have Shabbat dinners with some of the influential people in L.A. Mm-hmm. Uh, who were uh-huh. very like liberal liberal they're they're coming Mm -hmm. over and they're just like what the hell is happening to our party so i think it's good to kind of be in between and kind of shift um whichever direction you feel but you know i think the most important thing is that we're not afraid to to talk about it right that's the most important thing now that's big doc appreciate it appreciate it all right enjoy your kids good luck will do do. (laughs) 